I'll just make sure that I talk r really loudly. Thank you to the North Central CMA for having me here today. It really is a pleasure to come and talk about water birds. They've been at the centre of my mind or, or certainly near the centre for almost half of my life. And the key message today from me is that um, although there is some great stuff happening on farms in this part of the world and beyond, it's only the tip of the iceberg. The, the potential to expand our conservation efforts for water birds on farms is enormous. So if you remember nothing else uh, over the next half an hour or so, please just remember that. It, um, it really is a gold mine out there that we've, we've barely begun uh, to explore. And for those with keen eyes, just to get going, there are six different species of water bird in that photograph. And uh, at the end of the day, I believe we have Jim Radford who will be talking about water bird identification. So what I love about water birds in particular is that they unite us. They remind us that there's only one world and that there's only one nature and one landscape. So when we think about water bird conservation, we need to think about the climate. We know that that is a global issue. We need to think about how the economy works. We know that's global. We know that, uh, that the food system is global. It's not hard to go to a supermarket and buy things from five or ten different countries with, uh, without noticing. But obviously because there are migrants, and I believe today is the World Migratory Bird Day, conveniently. Because they, there are migrants among water bird species, they remind us that the world is connected. So what, what is happening in the Yellow Sea in China affects a lot of birds that occur around here in Barham. They've re, they've re, uh, Barham Kundruk, they've recently just um, left to go and breed up in the Northern Hemisphere. Amazing species. So that's what I love about water birds. They, they remind us that all humans, all countries are connected. It doesn't matter if it's Alaska, Siberia, um, or wherever. We, we are all in this together. So my focus today is about uh, food and biodiversity, um, farms and water birds. Now, there's no question that the development of modern agriculture that we know today has, has come at a big price. This amazingly convenient life that we have, where 90, more than 99% of us don't grow our, our own food, we rely on farmers to do it. Um, it's freed up so much time in society, we're able to develop incredible things like smartphones, and um, fancy cars, to name just two examples. It really has come at a cost. Um, all the global assessments of, of what has um, made biodiversity decline the most, they always have um, agriculture at or near the top of the list. So there's been, there's been great damage done. Now how do we reconcile the fact that we need more food and yet biodiversity like water birds are in decline? How, 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 can, we, how can we solve those two conflicting issues? It's a, it's, a real, it's a really tricky one to talk about and that's what I'm hoping to, to touch on uh, with this talk. When we think about uh, water bird conservation, a lot of us and as a community and society as a whole we tend to think of protected areas, they're the places where we're going to look after birds. But of course they're, they're not enough, they only cover 10% of the landscape and a lot of species as you'll see are dependent on the wetlands and the habitats on farms anyway. National parks don't have um, a representative sample of the different kinds of wetlands out there in the landscape. But this was a lovely day, this is a record day for me. I took over 500 photos 
that's over there in the Andes. And um, just to, to, to set the, the, the picture for the global perspective, in 2010, Wetlands International did an assessment of all waterbird populations and 44% of them, almost half, were decreasing. There are about 16 or 17 percent that were increasing. The rest were stable. So you can see we really do have a problem. Australia is certainly part of that problem. Although compared to Africa, South America and Asia, we're, we're doing relatively well. Just like North America and Europe. So that's the global story. Now when you think of threatened water birds, these are the two species that I hope spring to mind. There are only two species that are listed as endangered at the national and global level. So what I mean is the Australasian bittern and the Australian painted snipe are listed as endangered under the Commonwealth Act, which is the EPBC Act, and they're also considered endangered by the, uh, the global authority, the IUCN. Yeah, Ron. Where are they, uh, where's their habitat? Uh, their habitat? Well, they, they both like um, wetlands with water plants. In which part of the country though? they are? This is a very good area for them. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that's very interesting that there's only two uh, water birds that are listed as endangered at the national and global level in Australia and their stronghold is, is in you know, the southern Murray-Darling Basin. So I'm going to focus on these species quite a lot because I think um, you know, they're, they're extremely important. When we think about conservation it makes sense to go to the species that are in the greatest need um, of of our attention, of, of our conservation efforts. Just to put it in context, the numbers uh, in the last few years for both these species, the estimates of the entire populations in Australia have ranged from about as, as little as 1,000 to about 2,500. So that's how many individuals we're talking about. There's the beautiful Australasian bittern. I try and learn things about water birds. What can they teach me about life? What do they say about humans? Um, Brolgas were the first bird that I studied closely and I thought, yes, amazing birds. They're monogamous. You know, they, they, they pair for life and they like dancing and they're tall and they <laughs> care for the young and all these, all these interesting things that, uh, that make them human. And then, then I started looking at the Australasian bittern. Very interesting difference. She can have, um, or I should say, he can have up to five females and they will all be nesting within his territory where he booms, which is, which is really interesting. It's a very poorly known bird, the Australasian bittern. We have to go to the UK to its closest relative, the Eurasian bittern, to glean some of our knowledge. But it does appear that, that it is the same here in Australia where um, one booming male, and when they make that big bunyip uh, bird sound, we thought was the sound of the bunyip, he might have two or three or, or perhaps more females. By the way, the female Australasian bittern she does everything. He, ha he has nothing to do with uh, incubation, uh, feeding the chicks. How big is he? Yeah, about that big. Yeah, and, and, as, and as you can see, quite stocky. And there's every chance that there's one within five or ten k's of us right now. Could almost guarantee it. The painted snipe, on the other hand, well, the male does all the incubation all the rearing of the chicks and, uh, and I don't doubt that, um, that, it, that an individual female painted snipe ha might have several males looking after her, her different clutches. 
So there's, um, there's all sorts of variations in the water bird world. It'd be about 15 years ago I met a guy, I think his name was Ken or Keith, I can't quite remember his, um, his, his name properly, but he was looking at homosexuality in black swans and how prevalent it was. So there's all, there's all sorts of variations out there. I'm sure you'd agree they're absolutely stunning. These painted snipe, this is, uh, this is uh, a photo from a friend of mine, Dylan, <coughs> quite a few years ago back uh, near Rutherglen. So I'm going to focus on vegetation <coughs> management, <coughs> farm dams, environmental water, and although there's no rice growing in Victoria, it's very relevant because it's only just there and uh, it's a really good example of the great opportunity <coughs> on farms. So the story for me began with Brolgers roughly about 15 or 16 years ago. There's a nest oh, a couple of hours from here with the usual clutch of two eggs, a beautiful cane grass uh, swamp. I, I was able to work out what were the most important breeding wetlands for brolgers and, uh, and, you know, and then we knew what sort of wetlands we could conserve to help the brolga population here in northern Victoria and southern New South Wales. But as I got into it more and more, it became, uh, it became very clear that there were so many other species involved that, that, that we had to consider. And, um, if you can just look, look at that cane grass, for example, and think about how it changes with different management. Sometimes it can be over my head, and other times it can be really short if it's been burnt or if it's been heavily grazed, and depending on the, uh, the flooding regime. So think about all the changed structure and how that might affect different species. Uh, because of course they've all got different habitat requirements. There we've got a whiskered tern, a pink-eared duck and a black swan and you'll probably recognise the painted snipe. So what I came to, the, the way I came to think about it was the Vegetation Cover Balancing Act. So some species don't like any at all and then others like really dense and thick vegetation. Now apologies for those that don't like graphs, but, but on this side here we've got the number of species and so we go from zero right up to 50 and then down the bottom here we've got the average height of the vegetation, be it cane grass or spike rushes or whatever it might be. And it goes from zero, 50 to a metre, there's 100 centimetres right up to two and a half metres, three metres. And, and you can see the trend. At first, although there's a lot of variation, the trend is at first, the taller the vegetation, the more species you have in a wetland. Each dot here is a different wetland. There's 94 altogether. So the more, uh, the taller the vegetation, the more species you have. Look at these sites here. They're around a metre on average and you've got a good 20 species. But then the, the trend changes and it starts, it starts dropping away. So, the, so hopefully you, you, can, you can see what I'm getting at here, that there's, um, there's no single way of managing wetlands for all species. We need some wetlands for this species and some wetlands for that species. Yep. Imaging vegetation, so that's not so like uh, the um, lignin or stuff like that. Uh, so it's only stuff that's coming up out of the water, but the, the wetlands can be drying out anyhow from time to time, isn't it? So, so that would be reeds that would grow in water you're talking about. Yep, it's, it's all of those things you mentioned. It is lignum and it, it is things that, uh, it, that are left there dry. It's whatever's coming out of the water when it's flooded. So, so that includes lignum. Any, any vegetation in the, uh, 
in the wetland really that's coming above the water that isn't trees. Yeah. Now, I, I touched on it a moment ago, but grazing is obviously a huge influence on how much uh, vegetation is there. And when we talk about farms and the potential of farms, this is probably the single, the single biggest uh, advance we can make is um, ensuring that these beautiful wetlands out there aren't grazed when they're full. It does all sorts of damage to uh, you know, stirring up the water and the increased nutrients from all the, from all the poo and, uh, and various other impacts. So when we think about farms and when we think about water bird conservation, <coughs> excuse me, grazing is, a, is an enormous um, uh, area of, of potential change for us. Now apologies for the bad scans, but hopefully you can see Australia down the bottom here. And then we go up to, uh, oh, this is Alaska and, and, and Siberia, you've got India here, Sri Lanka, and all the countries through here that are sort of half hidden like, like the Philippines. These are actual band recovery birds um, and, and recited leg, leg flags. That, so we, that we're absolutely certain that these movements have been made. They're for two different species. This map here is the sharp-tailed sandpiper, and this one here is the even smaller redneck stint. They both occur around Kundruk and Barham here. And isn't that just amazing? Uh, it, it, never, it never ceases to amaze me personally. They've all just left now. Just in the last uh, month or so, they've all headed back. They stop along the way in places like the Yellow Sea in China where there's enormous development where huge numbers of these birds are trapped along the way uh, for food. But those that make it end up in their, in their breeding grounds right up in the Arctic. So there's a, there's a a really good illustration of the global um, perspective of water bird conservation. Now, the thing with those migratory shorebirds, like the sandpipers and the stints, they love mud flats. That's why they're in places like the Yellow Sea, because of the vast mud flats. Um, how many of you have been to Broome? Quite a few. We would have seen um, Roebuck Bay and those amazing mud flats there with the 10 metre tides, 80 mile beach a little bit further south. These are Australia's best areas for these migratory shorebirds. They love mud flats. Just like the Tullacool evaporation ponds up the road near Warcool. So it's kind of funny that you can have a situation like this where grazing to reduce the amount of vegetation and make them more like open mud flats with, with less vegetation can benefit migratory shorebirds. So there's no right or wrong here. It all depends what your objectives are, which species you're targeting, and what kind of wetland it is, I suppose. This is a site near Leeton, many of you will be familiar with, called Five Bow Swamp. It's a Ramsar site, very significant, and they're using grazing there to, to control the kumbungi and other water plants that, um, that are great for some things, but, but not so good for others. I don't have a lot of time to focus on this, but it was my privilege back in 2001 to trial the first 11 properties where we delivered environmental water using the irrigation infrastructure just across the border here. This is such a wonderful thing where you can go to a black box site that is quite degraded and deliver environmental water using all the channels that uh, people are growing rice and, and so on with, or get, that's the way they get the water to their to their rice crops 
And you can see you can see the before and after here. It's the same site. There's that tree. You know, just a wonderful response from water plants like Nardu and Lignum and the Eleocaris spike rushes. It's now expanded to over a hundred properties and this is just another example of the sort of thing that, that, um, that is possible on private land. Because when we think of environmental water, often we think of public land. Yeah? What period of time was that? Look, I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, like 10 years or something? Or oh, the, 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 the difference here? Mm. Oh, no, about eight weeks. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, the response is staggering. Yeah. So, so this is this is when it's uh, this is when it's dry, and you've often got a lot of weeds, like rye grass and barley grass, and then along comes the water. All those weeds die, and you get beautiful native water plants coming up. And obviously, it's really good for tree health as well. Okay, Barham Kundruk is about here, just off the map. You can see Denny over there and we've got a Chukamoama down here about five years ago to help prioritise um, the wetlands that should receive this environmental water. Uh, we, we mapped all those wetlands. The red ones are red gum, the black ones are black box. And then there's the not, uh, often not recognised grey box wetlands. There's open lignum nida goosefoot wetlands and other types. And then we have the very challenging task of trying to work out uh, the, the priorities. Because we know that there's not enough water to maintain all wetlands. There's no going back to 200 years ago. And so ultimately you decide you know, and, and government agencies are in the process ultimately of deciding which wetlands will be retired. Which ones are the priorities? We can look at woodland birds. This is the Jimmeringal and Cochrane Creeks. <coughs> Excuse me. To help work out what areas should be a priority. The darker the dots here, the more woodland birds there are, the more species like the hooded robin. So that can help us prioritise where the water ought to go. So basically we're looking at maintaining the best sites here to begin with. Of course Walkall's not that far away and neither is Blighty between Deneliquin and Finlay. And there's the same situation here. You can see that this this end of the Tuppel Creek, there's not a lot of uh, bird richness there. The darker dots are where the, where the better vegetation is. And just to finish off, one of, the, one of the very difficult things to grapple with is ultimately a lot of these systems are changing. They're in a, they're in a great state of change beyond, beyond the normal um, background levels of change if you like. So ultimately a lot of red gum is, is going to become black box with the reduced frequency and duration of flooding. And so that will mean that there's a whole lot of losers and some winners as well. It's certainly a great, a great era of change that we live in. Now farm dams, the potential is enormous. No one really knows, but there's somewhere between half a million and four million farm dams in Australia. They're, they're the best estimates that I can find. And I suppose it depends how you define a farm dam, but there's at least hundreds of thousands of them. And you can imagine the, the difference we could make for water bird conservation if even only 1% of them were, were being managed for habitat. Here's a classic uh, difference. The one down the bottom is a fairly normal farm dam with you know steep sided banks, very heavy grazing impact, no water plants. Whereas the uh, the farm dam up the top here, you can see there's water plants, 
it's got shallows, and these are just the sort of typical results from a 20 minute survey. You've got all sorts of um, water birds and frogs. It's quite striking. These, these results are, uh, are out there all the time. We've got sites like this one around Hay, on the Hay Plain, that already have existing habitat values. You can see all that stuff in the foreground is uh, Eleocara spike rushes, really good habitat. In there you've got the Balin's Crake and other uh, special water birds. So the sort of thing you can do there, and that's, and that's what we've been doing, is, is extending the area of shallows that can form. The reason why we've got funding in this particular area, in the War War area, is because a huge pipeline is being put in um, to, to replace the, the stock and domestic um, channel system that delivers water to ground tanks. There's over 600 ground tanks, uh, which are farm dams, and they're being, over time, converted into troughs. So there's a big loss of habitat, and the ones that, these farm dams that have good habitat to begin with, we're, we're looking at maintaining those and even improving them. These are the, these are the fresh mud flats, ready to grow some spike rushes, this whole project, just look at these photos, only cost about two and a half grand for the earthworks, for the fencing. It's only a, quite a small site, but you can see, um, you can see the scale. If you extrapolate, extrapolate that across dozens or hundreds of farm dams, it really can make a big difference. Now you might remember the, oh, only just got its head there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It just made it. <laughs> you can see you can see some beautiful cane grass and kumbungi in the background and some lovely mud flats there. That is a farm dam. Here's another site that we've been working on in the last year or two up around hay. Um, the final design ended up changing a little bit. But basically, uh, this is the existing farm dam. Uh, a seven hectare area has been fenced off from grazing, a dedicated habitat area. A reed bed pit has been dug to target the Australasian bittern so that it'll grow kumbungi or phragmites. And they can roost in there and feed out in this existing spike rush and cane grass that is there anyway because there's basically an overflow from this farm dam. Now using the fill from the reed bed pit, we've created two uh, mud flat islands. And it's all about targeting the Australasian bittern and with the mud flats targeting the migratory, migratory shorebirds. That dam would be natural flooding, wouldn't it? Sorry? That dam would be natural flooding, wouldn't it? It does, exactly, exactly. So now, now uh, when water goes out into that overflow area, Ron, it fills the reed bed pit and goes across the, the mud flats. So it's basically just um, value adding to the existing habitat. It's uh, in increasing the carrying capacity, if you like. And here's an irrigation storage uh, just up the road between here and Deneloquin. And simply because there's Kumbungi in it and because there's mud flats, you support uh, southern bell frogs and the beautiful red knee dotterel. It's amazing just the little things that make such a big difference. Again, here's a fairly, uh, fairly normal, crappy farm dam. Wood duck, grey teal, white-faced heron, galah, maybe a plains fo froglet, versus this wonderful oasis. You know, a real striking difference. You can see the, the enormous potential here on farms. 
Now I won't uh, stay on this too long, but adding logs, there's, there's some great studies done showing the value of adding logs and how that helps stimulate invertebrate activity, which is obviously great for the whole system, great for water birds. It added, uh, added um, logs at a, a sort of rate of about four tonnes per hectare, four cubic metres per hectare, and that seemed to make uh, a significant difference. There's lots of other things we can do for farm dams. It's not just about managing grazing and about creating shallows. We can add organic matter. We, we can put up nest boxes for ducks, rocks, pontoons, all sorts of stuff. Can you believe that is a farm dam? They're all migratory shorebirds like the sharp-tailed sandpiper. Beautiful mix of habitat. This is, this is the sort of thing that's possible. I'm not sure how much time I've got left, but I did want to um, tell you all about the exciting results from the last two rice seasons. Um, the last of the rice is just being harvested now, and over the last two seasons, uh, the most amazing results I've had uh, ever uh, for Australasian bittern and Australian painted snipe. It seems an unlikely place to find the two most threatened water birds, but there they are. Didn't, yeah. They certainly do. It's war at the beginning of the season. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's war. One of the great things about the bittern is there's only ever just, you know, two or three every 50 or 100 hectares. They don't do any damage to the, to the crop. It's not like the thousands of teal or, or whatever it might be. But yeah, make no mistake, it's war early in the season. And it's not so much that they want to kill them, they just want to scare them away onto the neighbour's place. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Collie Ambly, for those that, that don't know, it's up near Griffith. And um, with very limited funding, this is all I could do this past season. I randomly selected 25 rice farms. We already know that the Bittens really like the aerially sown crops, or those done with a spreader as opposed to drill sowing or combine sowing. So we've already figured out that Australasian bitterns have a preference for the sowing method, which seems quite funny. Uh, but it's because of the water management early in the season. Basically, the aerially sown crops, the, uh, the system gets going earlier and presumably, presumably the prey is there, things like the frogs. So these are 44 sites on 25 randomly selected farms and I emphasise random because last season we got great results and all the numbers were really good, staggering numbers, unprecedented numbers for the Australasian bittern, but we didn't know how biased our sample was. You know, did we happen to have every rice grower contacting us reporting bitterns and then I'd go there and follow them up? You know, we had no way of knowing how representative our sample was. Not this season just finished, but the one before, there was 113 and a half thousand hectares of rice. It's quite a bit less this season. It's probably going to finish at around 75,000 hectares. So we're very careful to get a, a representative sample. Anyway, in Collie we've done that. And these are the ones with bitterns. You know, it's really quite amazing. So from just 25 farms, uh, 12 of them have bitterns, virtually half. Uh, again, apologies for those that hate graphs. You can see this is the height of the rice. It's getting higher. And, uh, and this is the cover, the aerial cover of the rice. And you can see that they're only coming in, these red, red diamonds are the bitterns. They're only coming in once the, uh, the crop is about 30 or 40 centimetres high. So we know they come in two months after sowing. Yes? So, so where are the trees for the bitterns to sit in when they're... 
Bitterns never sit in trees. Uh, a lot of people get mixed up with the Nankeen night heron. Um, the immature can look similar. Um, I've never seen an Australasian bitten in a tree, and as far as I know, I never use them. Yeah. Yeah, the, the boom, the big boom, and uh, there's probably more photos coming up, hopefully. Uh, you'll be able to see a Nankeen night heron. Like if you go down the river here, you'll flunch, flush sometimes big numbers of them. And the young ones have a really streaky best, but they're quite a lot smaller. You might remember Ron asked me how big the bittern is. The Australasian bittern, it's twice as big. So they only come into the rice crops about two months after sowing, once there's enough cover for them to hide in it. We're slowly figuring out what it is they like about certain rice crops. You can see Kumbungi here growing in the channel around the edge, the toe furrow. And uh, sites with Kumbungi almost have, a, have a, twice the chance of supporting bitterns. So that's one thing that we've we found. And after an enormous amount of effort, uh, we finally found them breeding. Now talk about the secret lives of water birds. Well this was, this was a really, um, what's the word, privileged insight. You know, so few nests of this species have ever been found. And, um, and here they are nesting in rice crops. It's really quite amazing, this, this nationally, globally endangered species. We had great inklings, you know, great feelings that they were, but demonstrating it was, was another thing altogether. I thought I was going to have bitten the dust <laughs> out in a rice paddock. It was, uh, this was the first nest I found. It was just extraordinary to see these uh, beautiful little chicks out there. And you're probably wondering, well, what about harvest? Now, they all have plenty of time. One, we found four nests in total, and uh, one was quite close, but uh, certainly the, the other three, they have plenty of time before harvest. They need 22 days for incubation, and then about another 55 before the chicks are flying. And so potentially, this is an amazing way of producing food and uh, supporting endangered species at the same time. In science, there's fancy names like the fixed line transect. Um, I found this 18-day-old chick with the random pea meander. <laughs> I, I, was, I was on a bank and, uh, and walked down it to, uh, to take a leak. <laughs> And this, this thing moved in the grass. You see, it gets very difficult because they, they leave the nest. They leave the nest after about two weeks. And so, it's very, you know, for any of you that know what a rice crop's like, good luck finding, finding a little chick somewhere out there. So it's very difficult to work out breeding success. Anyway, I was just about to um, shake a leg. And, <laughs> and in the grass, there was movement. I thought it was a, uh, I thought it was a cat. And I parted the grass, and here were these two beautiful 18-day-old chicks still going strong, already about 50 metres from the nest that I'd found. Like, that's quite possibly the same bird. So, yeah, wonderful results there. We trialled a little drone to help us find the nests. Of course, it's a lot of effort. And, um, you know, walking around the rice so much, we probably start to impact the yield. And it showed some promise. Now, what we're hoping to trial either this coming season, this coming summer, or the one after, is you're sort of modifying the, the way that rice is growing to even further benefit um, water birds like the Australasian bittern. We're looking at having a, a dedicated habitat bay where it can be managed entirely for, uh, for the bitterns and, and other, other water birds. And, and obviously it would be, it would be free of uh, you know, the various chemicals that are used to grow rice. Um, we, we're hoping to get funding to be able to subsidise the farmer for the cost of the water and 
the earthworks that are required to reconfigure the bay. But again, the, the potential is really exciting. Early in the season, um, sharp-tailed sandpipers like these also use rice crops. They really, you know, it really is surprising, like when you compare it to other crops, like say cotton or wheat uh, or pasture, um, it really is phenomenal. And you know, I'm well aware that rice growers have been sort of painted as environmental villains for a long time. It's, it's a lot of water that is that is used, but you really, um, we really need to start thinking of, and, and weighing up. Uh, um, you know, where we've got to grow the food to begin with, you know, what crops are more desirable? Where are the best opportunities to produce food and support biodiversity? My best estimates for the golden-headed cysticola are that they're breeding in their tens of thousands. Almost every rice crop has golden-headed cysticolas. I found their nests and lots of unfledged young. And like I said before, uh, the best results ever for Australian painted snipe. The season before last we had 87. Um, now our sample of the rice is, uh, is tiny, it's only about 5%. So if you extrapolate our results, you know we're talking about hundreds of painted snipe using rice, we're talking about hundreds of bitterns using rice. So very, very significant for species of, for which there's only about a thousand or two thousand left. Um, do, they, do they go back to the same spot to, to nest each time? The bitterns? Yeah. Um, it would appear so, but of course we've got no marked birds. You know, they get some names like Barry and, <laughs> and Bernadette, but we don't actually know for sure who's who. Um, <laughs> But it, do, it does appear that they, they come back to the farm, like even if the crop has moved over there, you know, the, the, there will be a pair back there. So if you create that bay, then you, you must be pretty sure that they'll actually go and nest in that bay, or is that sort of identified as already nesting there? Um, it remains to be seen, yeah, and that's why we're trialling it. Um, it's, it's just to, to further boost the, the, the benefit, if you like, yeah. Um, this is an eastern grass owl. Um, I can't believe it. They're, they're not really even meant to be in the Riverina and we found at least five of them just this past season, just two or three months ago. Uh, for those that don't know them, they're quite similar to the barn owl, but a lot darker and the legs are longer and so on. And they're a bit of a wetland bird. They're, they're a bit of a water bird. They, um, they nest on the ground, unlike most owls, and here they, here they were roosting in rice crops. What was their name? Eastern grass owl. Yeah. Um, and just finishing up on the bitterns and the rice, we're just about to, uh, to publish these. These are our, the first edition of our bitten friendly tips rice growing tips. So we've been able to work, we've got a lot more to learn, it's early days, we've only done two seasons, but we've, we've been able to uh, work out that they love aerially sown crops, as opposed to the, the combine sown or drill sown. So if a farmer's sitting there deciding, oh, I don't know what to, which way to go this season, oh bugger it, I'll, I'll go aerially sown for the bitterns, great. Um, the earlier the crop is sown, the greater chance of supporting bitterns. The rice season already means that the bitten, the bitten breeding is delayed. We know that the, uh, the chicks, after my random pea meander, we know that the chicks use the thick cover on the banks to hide in, even though it is weeds like barnyard grass. We've worked out that they, they favour the largest bays, so the bigger the bay size the better. They use small stands of kumbungi, um, at least for roosting and feeding. We know that's important. And it's a bit of a no-brainer that reducing pesticide use as much as possible, especially things like chlorpyrifos that kills um, frogs and, and whatnot, is going to uh, 
is going to benefit them because it, may, it will mean more, there's more prey available for the bitterns. Um, we're also looking at providing habitat outside of the rice season. That's a big question. Hundreds of bitterns just left the rice in the last month. Now if any of you know where they go, please let me know. <laughs> there, there might be a regular movement to the coast, we're not sure. Um, I see foxes and to a lesser extent cats all the time walking up and down the banks, so controlling them is obviously another good bitten friendly rice growing tip. Avoiding disturbance and just learning as much as we can. So they're the, they're the tips as they stand today. And I wanted to finish up with a little uh, fella. His name's Toka. I met him a few years ago. He was 13 at the time. And there he is with a little iguana that he's found. This is in Ecuador. And um, when we talk about water bird conservation, we can think about managing habitat. We can think about working out movement patterns, you know, creating new habitat, restoring degraded habitats. But at the end of the day, really, I think it's just our, it's how connected we feel to, to nature, to, to these habitats. Like, how much do you care to, um, to look after groups like water birds on your farms? And Toka, at 13, knew more than 200 bird species by call. Isn't that staggering? And not to mention his, his knowledge of, of mammals and frogs and reptiles and plants and so on. Um, it took me a few weeks to, to work it out and verify his knowledge. Um, of course there's this, you know, oh what is it? Uh, just trying to remember. Ecuador is the size of Victoria. And I think it has 1,500 bird species, you know, more than double all of Australia. And so it took quite a while to verify his knowledge. Uh, but yes, I have no doubt that, that it was somewhere between 200 and 300. And I just thought, wow, if, if, um, if kids and adults alike like that today in Australia had that, that connection, that, that level of knowledge, we'd be in a much um, better place. So I just wanted to finish off with that point. It makes you think about things like nature deficit disorder <laughs> from, from, from Richard Louvre, you know, where, where kids are really detached, especially, and, and adults. And uh, thank you to uh, all, all those people and organisations.